This video is brought to you by ASRock and the X299 Creator. If you're building an Intel system and you're wanting a great motherboard to be able to support your 10th generation socket 2066, Intel's CPU core, CPUs like the uh, Core i9 10980XE, the 18 core monster, you should give the X299 Creator a look because it's got 10 gig built in, a Quantia NIC, it's got an Intel 1 gig NIC, it has dual Intel Thunderbolt certified and fully operational dual Thunderbolt with dual mini display port in. So you can go from display port to mini display port in, and then you've got full Thunderbolt display over Thunderbolt with whatever add-in GPU you're going to use. You've still got four PCI Express slots that are physically by 16. You get three M.2. And with those 10th generation CPUs, those PCIe lanes are right into the CPU. So this is a great platform to use for high end content creation, 10 gig NIC plus Thunderbolt plus all that PCIe. It's a pretty good setup. Thanks, Azrock. <laughs> the Hygon C86, X86 Mystery CPU. These are incredibly rare. I'm fortunate because an anonymous, awesome person has let me borrow these Hygon systems for so long and play with them and do stuff. So thank you. And if this is your first, you know, it's like the forbidden Chinese x86 server CPUs. I mean, what's not to be excited about that? You know, doesn't that make it twice as exciting, twice as taboo? In case you missed it, Dr. Cutris at Anantech did like the full rundown, an insane amount of work exploring these two systems. We've got a rack mount, 64 core, it's two 32 core CPUs uh, in you know, this rack mount server configuration. And then we also have a desktop, a more desktop-ish, eight core, you know, 3.2 gigahertz. The silicon in these is roughly equivalent to Zen 1. So why are we talking about Zen 1? Well, these CPUs are special, They're incredibly rare. These CPUs were produced as part of a joint venture between AMD and some other Chinese companies. So it was like a Chinese-American joint venture where uh, AMD got some cash and the Chinese companies got pretty good access to some technology and some other things. And uh, the silicon was produced mostly at Global Foundries. So there was, I mean, it was a pretty good, you know, East meets West kind of thing. Some of the parts of the Zen chip were changed as a result of the, the joint venture, things like the bits for silicon and some other stuff that we're not too sure about. And uh, Dr. Cutris ran through pretty much all of the available instructions. Now I tried to use Sand Sifter on this, but I ran into some problems getting my operating environment going. So the Sand Sifter thing might be another video, but it seems like some of the early instructions you encounter in Sand Sifter might be immediately reboot machine and forget everything you're doing. So it's like maybe they maybe they harden it against running Sand Sifter. I don't I don't know, but there's a lot of testing that uh, Dr. Cutris did for Anantech. But there were a couple of mysteries in there. It's taking me a little while to get there, but there's a couple of really interesting mysteries in there. One is AVX2 on Windows. AVX2 was very difficult, if not impossible, to access. If you run Hardware Info utilities it looks like the cpu is advertising avx2 support but if you go to try to use the avx2 instructions no data is returned or the program crashes or nothing works and so like you try to run you know cpu z which cpu z has a pretty good avx benchmark built into it and it just blah, it just crashes it doesn't it doesn't work there's there, there are problems there and uh, booting in linux uh you know checking proc cpu info it shows that avx2 is supported and running test programs in Linux for AVX2, they seem to be getting valid data, but there's something odd going in. So that was a little bit of a mystery. Um, you know, Dr. Cutters in his article initially said that AVX2 is totally not supported. And then he's like, well, maybe, maybe it is supported, but uh, we went through a bunch of stuff. He tried a bunch of stuff. I tried a bunch more stuff. And Windows just wasn't having it. We just, we, we couldn't get AVX2 working, but that does leave Linux. And so this video is mostly about the Linux testing that I did. So it's also buggy. So it might be that this is not a fully baked system. It's not, they didn't really finish the software qualification side of it. And that's why we're having trouble with the AVX2 instructions. And let me segue for a second here. AVX2, it's like, what is it? Why should you care? AVX2 is one of those single instruction, uh, multiple data instructions. SIMD is what that means. And so... If you're doing like graphics work or compression or decompression, you can load a bunch of data into a bunch of registers, slots on the on the processor, basically. 
and then you send the, the processor an instruction and you say, hey, do this operation, but do it to all of this vast array of data that I've loaded. So you may have heard of AVX 512. There's 512 registers of information with AVX 512. AVX 2, it varies, but you can load up a whole bunch of registers in parallel as long as you're doing the same operation on all of the registers, you benefit from this massively parallel operation. So the CPU is doing a lot of work in fairly large chunks at a time, and overall that speeds up the whole process really well. So you see that in compression, decompression, cryptography, that kind of thing. And so AVX2 should be there, we think, pretty sure. And on the Linux side, it definitely looks like it is, but sometimes some of these functions are initialized or managed from microcode or from the UEFI or from, you know, it's at least initialized by the UEFI so that it's ready to receive data. And it might be that the full support there doesn't work. Well, booting Linux on these things is challenging because the machine will hang or there will be a kernel panic or there's a crash. And it's, there are some patches in there for these CPUs. In fact, the original patch for these on the Linux kernel mailing list is basically, we're gonna add support for some new CPU IDs and that's it, that's all I have to worry about. But if the UEFI support's not complete, like the programmable interrupt controller, that can cause problems and that's a problem that I ran into. The ACPI tables, which is usually, you know, tables of configuration about your hardware. None of that seems to work properly on this for booting Linux. So with Ubuntu 19.10, which is what I ended up using for the testing that I'm gonna show you, I had to disable the a the advanced programmable interrupt controller with no APIC on the kernel command line. And I also had to set ACPI equal off, otherwise the system would not boot and operate reliably. You also tried Debian and Debian for that didn't, there's just, you know, the, the thing basically fought us at, at every turn to try to, uh, you know, suss out its secrets. But getting Linux booted, counting proc CPU info, we can see that AVX2 is there and it is supported along with a whole bunch of other instruction sets, freeze frame. And you can see that, you know, Linux at least kind of is working better than Windows. So let's run through some Pharaonix benchmarks. So first up is Rodinia V2.4. It's almost perfect scaling for a Threadripper 1950X, that's 16 cores. We're running 64 cores here across two sockets, two 32 core CPUs. You'd expect it to be about four times faster. And it is, it's about four times faster with Rodinia. Rodinia is really optimized for massively parallel operations. It's parallelizing with SIMD instructions as well as across sockets. And it knows about the different memory domains and it's a, basically a best case scenario and we are getting really good scaling with that. That's awesome and that is sort of the best result that we're going to see here. But not everything knows about this processor. Not everything is using an optimized code path. So if we look at TensorFlow. <laughs> TensorFlow is, you know, the Google AI thing and we always do cats per second. Well, the initial training for cats per second is to train that Cypher 10 data set. Well, it's not really that much faster than a 1950X, a Threadripper 1950X. And it turns out the TensorFlow apparently has some checks in it to say, is it this CPU family or that CPU family? If not, do this other thing. So, you know, the people at Google presumably have put in a lot of optimizations into TensorFlow, but those TensorFlows are not checking for instruction sets like they should, or there's some kind of weird side effect of the optimizations that they've done to where it just doesn't run well on this CPU. Maybe they issue some kind of a check to see, you know, is AVX2 properly supported, but it's failing that kind of a check. I didn't really dig into it too much, but if I forced AVX2 on, I could claw back some of the TensorFlow performance, but mostly it was okay once you sort of reconfigure it, recompile it, do what you can, and try to actually get it running. You can, it was about twice as fast as a Threadripper 1950X. Not four times as fast, but about twice as fast in the end, so. Not terrible, let's, let's keep digging. XS Bench, what about XS Bench? XS Bench was one that I was not able to resolve the performance of with compile tweaks. And so uh, there are some changes to the math functions on these CPUs and this really does smell like a code path problem, but I couldn't suss out sort of where the performance hangup was exactly. I, I could see that the SIMD instructions were being used, but the CPU also didn't seem super busy. Like when you run XS Bench, the CPU is pegged at 100%. When I was running it on these, it was like 70 to 100%. And so there was clearly some bottleneck somewhere in an unexpected place, but I didn't, I couldn't really figure it out. FFTW is also uh, another benchmark that scaled reasonably well, but it would only run on one CPU socket. So I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, even when I could force it to run on cores on the other CPU socket, it was still storing stuff in the memory of the other CPU. 
maybe a Linux kernel bug. Redis was also another puzzler. So Redis, I would not think would really even care what it's running on, but the performance there was much worse than I expected. And I'm really, I'm not sure what that issue was. LZ Bench, LZ Bench is, uh, is another uh, benchmark that's not super multi-threaded, but it uses SIMD. So you can have a program that's not super well multi-threaded, but uses SIMD to kind of do things in parallel. It's a different approach to parallelization. And it really was hobbled because I think it misdetected the CPU and it didn't use a code path that it probably could have. That may actually, all of these things may actually be compiler bugs that will be resolved in newer versions of the compiler. Although maybe not because these CPUs are not really going to see the light of day. So probably not worth adding fixes for these unless a lot of people have these CPUs. But that brings me to Time Spy. Wait, Time Spy? That's Windows Gaming. Well, you see, we've been talking about the server Hygon CPU, which is interesting in its own right. I mean, all of this is just fascinating. But the eight core desktop CPU really, I mean, you would look at it and you'd say, this is eight cores, mm, it's a, this is kind of like a Ryzen 7 1800X. So you run Time Spy, and the same GPU, same setup, same hardware, same drive, everything. It's two to 300 points higher. That's a lot, kinda, for you know a machine of this genre. Um, you know, it's upper end of 8,000s, lower 9,000s. Uh, this system generally is over 9,000 with a GTX 1080 and even a little bit more. And that's interesting because we know this is a Global Foundries process and we know this is older silicon and blah, blah, blah. Is it possible that there's some optimization in the microcode or this system where there's less overhead and that is why it's performing really well compared to a Ryzen 7 1800X. Are there any lessons learned from the 1800X that for whatever reason couldn't be fixed on an 1800X that exist here? <laughs> well, it turns out it's a hardware thing. At least I think it is. My best guess on this, after trying to rule out microcode and firmware and a couple other things, is PCIe layout. So I th I'm pretty sure this Epic-like CPU it's from Hygon. It's an AM4 socket, but it's soldered under the motherboard, remember. 32 PCIe lanes out of the socket. You know, traditional M4, it's only 24 lanes. Four lanes to the chipset, four lanes to the M.2, 16 to the GPU. But we've got 32 that we're working with, at least 32, maybe 38, on the Hygon system. And the Hygon system has two X16 slots. And no matter which GPU, no matter which slot my GPU is in, it links up at X16. So if I put the GPU in the top slot, the one closest to the processor, scores over 9,000 every time. If I move the GPU down to the second X16 slot, it is more like the, you know, 80, 800, 80, 900 score. So I think the difference, I think it is basically a Ryzen 7 1800X, but the clock speed is not as good, you know, 3.2 to 3.6, 3.7 gigahertz. But I think the performance delta in Time Spy is just because of the PCIe layout, and the PCIe layout is a little closer to Epic Embedded than Ryzen Desktop. That's a, the best explanations that I have for the two mysteries of how could the Hygon system possibly score higher in Time Spy and some other benchmarks where it's just a little bit higher than an 1800X. And the 1800X has the, you know, it should have some process advantages and it should be more mature software, and it should also have, uh, you know, just the, the clock speed advantage. I mean, the 1800X should clearly be the winner. But, you know, as we saw in Dr. Cutters' article, things like random number generation, you have a little bit of control over that in BIOS. So you can turn it off or some other options. But things like random number generations and, and other stuff that we use, you know, algorithms from the West, those don't run as well. And we can see that in some of, some of the benchmarks. And whether that's down to just configuration, ACPI, or firmware, I'm not a microcode. I couldn't say for sure but hopefully this additional testing is useful and you can check out the Pharonix benchmarks. I'm Wendell, this is level one, and if you enjoyed this video, please updo it. Then if not, you can you can downdo it too. I mean, that's fine. It's whatever. Hang out on the level one forums if you have any questions or want to help me out with the next video, or if you're a sand sifter expert and can figure out why it would reboot the machine after running sand sifter on different distros, that might be nice. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.